Hey guys, welcome back. Today we are going to discuss a very commonly asked uh, distributed system design interview question, which is designing a URL shortening service like Tiny URL. So let's first discuss the requirements for the Tiny URL service. Uh, we will first discuss the functional requirements. The functional requirements are the requirements which deals with the functionality of the service. So the very first functional requirement that we have is that given a big URL, the service should be able to generate a unique short URL. So let's suppose if two users come and they both even provide the same big URL, the service should be able to return two different unique short URLs to them. So this operation is a write operation on the service because what we are doing, we are actually creating and storing a mapping between a big URL and a short URL. Then the second uh, requirement is that given a short URL, the service should be able to find the mapping for that short URL. Uh, and if the mapping exists, it should return the big URL for that short URL. And if the mapping doesn't exist, then it should return not found. This is a read operation on the service because we are not creating any, any mapping. We are just reading if there is a mapping which is existing or not. The third functional requirement is the length of short URL should be six characters. So right now for the time being, we will limit the maximum length of the short URL to six characters and we will see how many uh, different uh, short URLs we can create using uh, the six character limit. And if in future we exhaust our limit for the number of generated short URLs, we can always increase the, the length of the short URL to seven, eight or more characters. The fourth requirement is that we would like to generate uh, short URLs in some what random manner. Although it's not a hard requirement because I don't think actually that there's any uh, issue if someone can guess what would be the next generated short URL by the service. However, uh, let me know in the comments below what do you think why it would be bad if uh, some user can guess what would be the next generated short URL. The fifth requirement is we do not want any anonymous user to create short URLs. So user need to have an account uh, with our service in order to create short URL. Uh, this is we are doing because we, do, we want to avoid any malicious user to just uh, bombard our service with the right request, like create generation of short URLs and we create a lot of short URLs. So we would like user to have an account so that we can actually uh, calculate how many user that how many URLs a user has uh, created. This uh, needing a user account for short URL creation is also important in a way that it actually give us the service developer or the service owner a way to monetize the service. We could have two different types of user accounts, free users which could maybe uh, create a limited number of short URLs and we could have paying or premium users which could create a large number of short URLs. So then the sixth thing is that we would like some sort of monitoring or analytics component in our service in order to monitor the overall health of the service and also in order to monitor different metrics of the service. For example, number of reads or number of writes per second happening in the service. So yeah, these are the functional requirements uh, for the uh, tiny URL service. Uh, now let's discuss the non-functional requirements. Now we will discuss the non-functional requirements for the service. The non-functional requirements are basically requirements which do not deal directly with the functionality of the service, but they deal with the health of the service. So let me give you an example. The very first uh, non-functional requirement is that the service should be fault tolerant and of course with related to it is that the service should be highly available. And what does it mean is that in case of faults or failure, the service still should be available to serve the users. Then the third non-functional requirement is we would like to minimize read and write latencies. And what it also means that service should be scalable and we should be able to uh, scale the service as, an, as the load increases on the service. Now as far as the uh, data consistency is concerned, we would like the 
the data consistency to be strong. What does it mean is that once a short URL has been created and returned to the user, and if the user tried to query uh, the big URL using the short URL, the service should be able to return the, the big URL. The consistency should not be eventual, where we have created a short URL, but then eventually when the user tried to query the big URL using the short URL, eventually user will get the big URL. We don't want that. We want a strong consistency here. Then the sixth non functional requirement is re uh, related to data durability. We want data to be durable. So what it means that once we have generated a short URL, we would like our short URL to live in the system till its expiration time. We don't want any type of data loss. The seventh uh, requirement is we would like to minimize cost. So what it means that we don't want to just start with hundreds or thousands of uh, servers. We would like to minimize cost. So we will start with the bare minimum number of servers that are required that are that we need in order to uh, actually uh, uh, serve all these non-functional and functional requirements. And of course, since our service will be scalable, so as the load increases on our service, we will scale our service by increasing more servers. And if the load decreases, then we will actually remove the servers uh, from our service to in order to minimize the cost. So these are the functional and non-functional requirements of the service. Now we will design the service based on these functional and non-functional requirements. Now we will discuss the application programming interface exposed by our service. So as we discussed before that in the functional requirements that we would like user to have an account with our service. So what it means that we need a logon API and a log of API. We will not be implementing an identity and access management system right now. Uh, we may be discuss it in some of the future videos. Right now what we will do, uh, we will use some external identity provider like Google or Facebook. So what we are actually doing is that in our service, we would like user to log on to our service using uh, users Google or Facebook account. So the user will log on to Google or Facebook and the identity provider will actually return a user token. So this logon API will return a user token. And of course there will be a log of API as well. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to discuss this right now. In some other future video, I can discuss how the log on and log off APIs work. Uh, right now, the main APIs that I would like to discuss are the, these two APIs. So we have one API, which is create short URL. So the user will call this API, providing us the user token. This is the user token that it, it, it gets from the log on API. This user token will help us to identify the, the user who's calling this function to create the short URL. The user will also provide a big URL and optional expiration time. Uh, we can right now assume that if the user has not, if the user is not uh, providing us an exp expiration time, we can uh, use an expiration time of maybe a year or five years, for example. So this API will take this information, will generate a short URL and will return this short URL to, to the user. Now the, the, the last API that our service will support is retrieving the big URL using a short URL. So this is the API get big URL, uh, which a user can call. We don't need a user token here because the read operation can be done by any anonymous user. And so any user can call it the short URL and it, the user can provide us a short URL. In that case, we will return a big URL if the, if the big URL exists for this short URL, otherwise we will return not found. Now let's see a very simple high level design of our service. So in this design, we have a user who's talking to our single application server in our service. And this application server is storing all the mapping between short and big URLs in a local database here. This design has several flaws. Number one is this design is not fault tolerant. The server, the single server can go down at any point in time, thus causing the unavailability of the service. Also, this server can also go down not just because of the failures or faults, but also due to some periodic maintenance as well. 
and so this design is not highly available uh, the other flaw in this design is that this design is not scalable maybe this single server can request can serve up to uh, 10,000 to 20,000 requests per second but what if the load increases and the number of requests increases to hundreds of thousands of requests per second so this design is also not scalable as well then this design also does not enforce the data durability because right now we are storing all the mapping here in a single server locally and what if the hard disk of this single server crashes it will cause all the mapping to be lost and that's why this design is not durable as well so you see right now that this design although it would serve the functional requirements of the service but it will not fulfill any of the non-functional requirement that we have maybe just one which is like minimize cost so you can see that it's not just the functional requirements but non-functional requirements also dictate how the design of the service should be look like now let's discuss this design in this design the user will talk to uh, any of the three application servers that we have in our service uh, via load balancer the load balancer is there now to distribute the read write request among these application servers in some maybe random way or round robin manner uh, so we will be using at least three application servers the reason being is that let's suppose if we only use two application servers then it's totally possible that this one application server could be down for some periodic maintenance maybe we are doing host operating system patching or we are deploying new builds of our service and during that time there will be just a single server that will be serving all the read write request and what if a failure happen at that time then the service will be unavailable and since we want our service to be highly available that's why we will keep at least minimum uh, three application servers in our service now during periodic maintenance we will or uh, we will actually do maintenance on a single server at a time so let's say if we are deploying a new build uh, of our service on these servers we will first deploy that build on server 1 so during that time server 1 will be down but server 2 and server 3 will be available to serve the user request once the deployment finishes on server 1 then we will deploy on server 2 during that time server 2 will be down for maintenance but server 1 and server 3 will be available to serve the user request and once the deployment finishes here then we will uh, continue the deployment on the server 3 this design is also highly scalable as well because we also have will have a monitoring system and this monitoring component or system will be monitoring the health of the of these application servers and let's suppose if the resource consumption uh, increases in this app in these application servers above certain threshold maybe for example if the cpu usage increases above 80 percent then we can actually introduce more application servers in this design and then we will configure load balancer here to route these uh, the new request to these uh, newly configured application servers as well and similarly if the load decreases uh, below certain threshold maybe let's suppose the cpu usage then drop down below 20 percent then we can also remove extra application servers until we only until we reach the minimum number of application servers which is three so this design is also highly scalable it, it also help us uh, minimize the cost because we will be using of course at least three uh, application servers but if we need to incre increase the number of servers due to increasing load we will increase the number of servers and if the load decreases we can always uh, remove extra servers from the uh, from the load balancer and keep our cost uh, minimum as minimum possible by introducing these three application servers we have tried to ensure that our design of the service is highly available and scalable 
But the thing is that unless our data store is also highly available, scalable and durable, we cannot ensure the overall design of our service to be highly scalable, highly available and durable. Let me give you an example. For example, we are using three application servers here, but this data store is running only a single server. Then what will happen? All the read and write requests will be going to that single server. This design is not highly scalable. Secondly, this design is also not highly available because this single server can go down at any point in time. And also, if the hard disk of the single server here crashes, then we will lose all the data. So this design is also not highly durable. So what it means that now in order for our service to be highly available, scalable and durable, we also need this data store to be highly available, scalable and durable. Today in this video, I'm not going to discuss how our data store would be highly available, scalable and durable. I will just give you some a little bit uh, information here. Maybe in future, in some future video, I will discuss how to design a highly available, scalable and durable data store. So right now what will happen is that this in this data store, we will have behind the scene. Let me go down. This data store would have different partitions. We will start with a single partition and as the, the data increases, in our data store, we can uh, partition the, those data. So it will have multiple partitions. And these inside those partitions, we will have two or more replicas or servers that will be storing that partitions information or data. And in this way, we'll make sure that the service, that the data store is highly available. So right now, let's say in a partition, if one of the host goes down, the other host will be able to serve the read and write request. Similarly, uh, it will be highly scalable because now we will have we will have multiple partitions, and as the the size of data increases, we will we will create more partitions uh, in the data store. And third, the, the design of this data store is durable because now we are storing, uh, in, a, in a single partition, we are storing the data in four different servers. And so if any of the server crashes, we still have this copy of the data in three servers as well. So today I'm not going to discuss the design of this data store. Uh, in a future video, I will discuss in more detail. Also, since the number of read requests will be way uh, higher than the number of write requests. For example, we can safely assume that for every short URL that is created, the users could try to query the big URL using that short URL maybe up to at least 10x times. So we know that if all the read and write requests go to this data store, it will put extra pressure on this data store. So in order to minimize load on this data store, what we could do, we could use some in-memory cache to store the mapping between a short URL and big URL. Uh, and then in that case, we have two options right now. One option is that in each application server, let me use a different marker for it. In each application server, we maintain a local in-memory cache. So these are local in-memory caches. local in-memory cache. The local in-memory cache would be nothing but a singleton hash map uh, in each application server in memory. And so the lookup is very fast, it's very fast. Uh, the other option that we have is that instead of using the local cache, we could also have a global cache. global in-memory cache. And in that case, what will happen for all the read requests, the app server actually can go to the global cache and check in the global cache whether the mapping exists or not. And if the mapping does not exist, only then they go to data store. 
Now, as far as this global cache is concerned, uh, of course, reading from a global cache is uh, will take more time as compared to reading from the local cache. So what we could do is that we can actually use both of them together where each server will have its local cache. It will first try to look up in a local cache, which is just a, a quick lookup in a hash map, in memory hash map. And if it doesn't find anything in the local map, then local cache, then it goes to the global cache. And if it doesn't find anything in the global cache, then it goes to a data store. And once it receives anything from a data store, it can actually copy it to the global cache. It can also copy it here in, in its local cache as well. We already have discussed uh, whether uh, we should use uh, local in-memory cache or global in-memory cache. Uh, however, here, just for the sake of completion, I would like to discuss one scenario where we will prefer global cache as compared to local cache. Let's give, consider, consider an example where a user sends a request for a short URL which does not exist in the data store. So let's suppose the app server receives the read request it will first look into its local cache. It will not find it in the local cache. Then it will go into a data store. It will not find it in data store as well. The data store will return not found because there is no mapping that exists in the data store for that short URL. Maybe it's a malicious user who's trying to just uh, send us uh, some random read request with the short URLs that have not been yet generated in order to cause some denial of service attack on our service. And we are receiving many, many requests. And now if they are, we are receiving many, many requests, then every time we will be having a cache miss here in the local cache. And we will be going to data store directly. And this will put extra load on the data store. In order to avoid this, what we could do is that when a data store returns us uh, that, uh, there's, uh, that for a short URL, there is no entry or there is no mapping in data store, we can actually store in the local in-memory cache a sentinel value which tells that for this short URL there is no mapping that exists. So now the next time if the request come here for this in the, to this app server, it will look into its local cache and it will find oh there is a sentinel value for, that sh for this short URL and so instead of going to data store it will just return uh, not found. But now this actually caused one more issue. Let's suppose now for that short URL, let's say the short URL was x, y, z, x, c, 0. <coughs> now a create request come. And this create request come here to this app server 2. The app server will now create a mapping here for this short URL uh, to a big URL. And maybe it will also invalidate the local in-memory cache here. But there is no way it's possible for app server 2 to actually invalidate the local memory cache of other servers. These are just in-memory hash maps that we have in these app servers. So this is one scenario where we will prefer a global cache. So in that case, what will happen? Let's say for the short URL for which there is no mapping exists, First, we will go here. The app server will check in the local in memory uh, cache, which is just a hash map. It will not find any entry. Then it will go to global cache. It will not find any entry there. Then it will go to data store. And data store will say there is no entry for that uh, short URL. In that case, we will only create the sentinel value in the global cache here. And then we will return this value not found. To the user and the next time the, the request comes from the user to read the short URL again, we will check local cache, we will not find it, we will go to global cache here, we will find a sentinel value and then we will return not found directly without going to data store and putting extra load or stress on the data store. And now what happens that now let's suppose if the if a create request come for the for this short URL, let's say it come to app server 2, what it will do here it will create the, the mapping here and also it can go here and invalidate the global cache as well for this, uh, for this uh, short link or short URL. And that's not easy because whether requests come to application server 1, 2 or 3, they all have access to global cache and, the, and regardless where the write request come, wherever the write request comes, the server then can directly go and invalidate the global cache for that short key. 
And so the next time the read happens, the read will, read will come to a server. It will not be found here in the local cache. It will go to the global cache since already invalidated. Uh, the cache is invalidated for this uh, key, short URL. So we will then go to data store. From data store, we will read the mapping. Then we will store that mapping in the global cache. Let's say if the request was read request come here, the server two will also store it here and then and then it will return the value back to the <coughs> uh, user. Now in the detailed design, we will first discuss how the short URL will be encoded. We have two mechanisms to encode a short URL. The first is base 62. What it means that we will be using a to Z, small characters, capital A to capital Z, big characters, and 0 to 9, 10 characters, so 26, 26, and 10, total 62 characters to encode short URLs. And if you are using 6 character length, then we can actually uh, encode 62 to the power 6, which is 56.8 billion short URLs that we can encode using this encoding mechanism. The other is base 64 so what we will do we will use a small a to z 26 characters capital a to capital z 26 characters 0 to 9 10 characters and we will also use dash or minus and an underscore character uh, so total 64 characters in order to encode the short url with base 64 we can actually encode 64 to the power 6 which is 68.7 billion short URLs. In one of the online resource uh, that you will find for, uh, for implementing or designing a short URL service, uh, the author has suggested to use plus and slash as the characters in the base 64 but we cannot use these characters because these characters are unsafe characters as far as HTTP request is concerned. And so in, in that case, if we use these characters, then we have to actually encode this plus as, uh, percent to be, and this slash as percent to F. And you see now a single character in the in the HTTP request will require three characters here, and which will then increase the size of the short URL to more than six characters. So plus and slash, these are not the right characters to use if you are doing base64 encoding. You should use dash and all under an underscore in that case. Now, as far as uh, generating a short URL is concerned, uh, if you check online resources, you will see that different online resources have discussed these three approaches. So the first approach is to actually take the big URL and then take the MD5 hash of the big URL. This actually give us a 128-bit hash value. And this 128-bit hash value, when it is encoded using, let's say, base64, it results into 21 characters. But now, if you remember, the original requirement uh, of our one requirement for of our service was that we would like to use up to six characters at most. So what it means that now we have to uh, drop either the first 15 characters or the last 15 characters from this uh, 21 character encoded uh, MD5 hash. This will actually increase the probability of collision between the short URL generated by taking the MD5 hash of different big URLs. And so this is clearly not a feasible approach for us. The second approach that have been discussed in different online resources is that we will use Zookeeper to keep or to maintain a range of counters that we will assign to each application server uh, in our service. So the application server will go to Zookeeper and will read the range of uh, counters that it can use. And then it will assign, it will start assigning 
the short URLs uh, using those counter values. However, I think this will actually add extra complexity to our design because now we are relying on another service which is Zookeeper. This will also add to our cost as well. And what we are accomplishing through Z uh, Zookeeper, we can actually accomplish it without even using Zookeeper as we will discuss later. The third approach that different online services have discussed is using a key generation service. So what is happening is that our application servers, let's suppose in our service, this is the user talking to load balancer to our app servers app server let's say one app server two and these app servers are talking to a key generation service and this key generation service is then returning a unique short url to these app servers this actually just shift the complexity of the design of uh, generating a short URL to this uh, key generation service uh, and we really don't need this key generation service because we have an easier mechanism to actually generate this short URL that I will discuss later now and another issue with this KGS service is that now the design of this KGS service will also dictate the overall design of our uh, whole service for example let's say whether this kgs service is just using a single server or not if it's using a single server then it will be against the non-functional requirements of scalability high availability that we have because now this kgs service will become a bottleneck if we now adding extra servers here then whether the two requests to get a key or a new short URL from these application servers will be going to different servers in KGS and if yes, how they will be coordinating to actually give different short URLs, unique short URLs to these two different app servers. So that's why I think even using key generation service to generate a unique short URL is not a good choice. It adds extra cost, ex extra complexity to our design and we have a simple approach, simple mechanism to actually generate uh, sh short URL that we will discuss now. So we don't need to rely on Zookeeper or a separate key generation service to generate short URL. We can actually use this simple mechanism to generate short URLs. So let's suppose we in our design we have these three application servers and we have in our data store we have a counter with a value 1. So what will happen now that whenever these application servers uh, comes up and then they receive some write request, they will actually go to this counter and it, they, will op they will try to read the value of this counter and also increment it by some uh, number, let's say 10, 100 or 1000 in a transaction and then they will try to commit the transaction. And if the transaction succeed, then it means that they can use that range of counters to actually generate short URL. Let me give you an example now so that it becomes clear. Suppose the counter has one value here. The first time application server comes up, it will go to the data store, open a transaction, read this value one, increment it by, let's say by 100. So it increment this value from 100 to 101 and commit the transaction. If the transaction succeed it means that this application server can use the range from 1 to 100 in order to generate short urls so now when a create request come it will use first value 1 to generate a short url then a next value come it will use 2 to actually generate short url then 3 then 4 then 5 then 6 up up to 100 now let's look at app server 2 after app server 1 app server 2 goes to the data store 
it opens a transaction, read the value and increment the value by 100. So it increment the value to 201 and now it knows that it has from 101 to 200 is the range of the counter that it can use to generate short URL. And then this application server 3 goes here. It opens a transaction in the within the transaction it reads the value of the counter and also increment it by 100. So it incremented to 301 and now it knows that it actually can use from 201 to 300 for the counter value if the transaction that it tries to commit is succeed. So the question is why we are trying to read and increment this value in a transaction. The reason being this is totally possible. It's a distributed system. So any two servers can actually go and try to read this value and increment this value at the same point in time. So let me give an example further. For example, now we these servers have have this uh, uh, range of uh, counter values to generate short URL. And we have a load balancer here, which is sending create request, maybe randomly or maybe in a round robin uh, mechanism or maybe some using some other policy to these servers. And so they are using the the counter values from these ranges. And it's totally possible that when the requests are coming that two of these servers actually uh, exhaust their range. So let's say both server 2 and server 3 exhaust their range. So now they need to go and get the ne next counter value. So what will happen that both of these will try to read this counter value. So both of them will open a transaction read this value. So both server 2 and server 3 will read the value 301. They both now will increment the value to 400 and they will try to commit the transaction. But now at this point only one of the server will be successful in committing the transaction. Let's say server 2 was able to commit the transaction. In that case server 2 will know that okay that uh, now I can actually use from 301 to 400 as the counter range to generate short URL. And the application server 3 will get a commit conflict. In that case, the application server 3 will try to again go open a transaction, read the value again, and this time it will read the value 401. Then it will increment this value by 100 and then it will try to commit the transaction and if the transaction is successful it will know now that okay now it means that this value will be 501 and here i have a range from 401 to 500 that i can use in a short url <coughs> so the question is now whether this reading of the counter value incrementing it in a transaction now becomes a bottleneck for the service no why? Because we are not going to this data store and incrementing this counter by one. We are only incrementing it by, let's say, some configurable value, which would be either 10, 100, or even 1000. So what it means, if you are using a value of 100 to increment this counter, it means that each of these application server will actually can generate up to 100 short URLs locally. And only on the 101th time, they have to go to the data store to read and increment the counter value. And then it means if the request have been distributed by load balancer on these uh, uh, application servers randomly, then the probability that they all will go to this data store to read and increment the counter value at the same time will be very less. So I think this is this mechanism is uh, I think totally feasible mechanism for us to actually generate a uh, short URL. We do not need actually to use Zookeeper or a key generation service to generate short URLs and add extra complexity in our design. It's a very simple, elegant design that we can use. There's one flaw in it, and this flaw is all, all, all and this flaw also exists in the in using Zookeeper and uh, the key generation service is that let's suppose. <coughs> Right now, this app server has this range, 
and it has only used from 401 to 410 and then this app server goes down for some reason maybe some failure happened or uh, the system crashes it means we will lose some of the counter values now and we won't be able to generate short url but i think right now it's fine because since we are using 60 uh, base 64 encoding we have almost 68 point 68 billion uh, short urls that we can generate so for the time being i think we will be fine uh, using this approach now let's discuss the database schema and the design of our service uh, since uh, our service requires very simple mapping between a short url and a big url and there is no relation between different uh, uh, objects or different structs in, in our uh, service. So we can actually just use a NoSQL database and we don't need to use a relational database. Uh, maybe in some future video, I will discuss what are the difference between a NoSQL and a relational database, what are the requirements which actually dictate that we use NoSQL database and what are the requirements that dictate that we use relational database. Right now, if we see the requirements of the uh, tiny URL service, we see we know that we want service to be highly scalable, highly available, durable, and um, uh, there will be like billions of uh, uh, short URLs that we can generate. And so, in that case, a NoSQL seems to be an obvious choice. So, in our NoSQL data store, we will have two types of tables or buckets. Uh, which we call in some other in some data, uh, databases so there will be a url mapping uh, table the primary key would be short url and of course what will happen whenever we are creating this mapping so first we will generate a short unique short url and then we will write to this table using short url as a primary key we will ins we will also write big url the creation time, the expiration time, and also we will also add a user ID uh, of the user who actually created this short URL. And now when we have to read from the data store, during the read operation, we will just directly use this uh, primary key. It's a, it's a key value store. So we can just look up using this short URL for, for the value and we will get all this data. We will also have another uh, table uh, for the users where the primary key is the user ID. It will have other extra information about the user like the name, email, the creation time of the account, the last login time, and an optional URL count, which is an integer. So now you can see what happens now uh, when a write operation occur. The, the write request will go to an application server. The application server will generate a short uh, URL as discussed before. Then it will actually let's suppose if we are not updating this url count then it will just directly write to this uh, table the short url the big url the creation time expression time and the user id and this user id it can actually get from the user token and in order to update this table we don't even need any transaction object we are already making sure that the short url which is the primary key is uniquely generated and so there's no possibility of any collision or conflict between two write operations that will try to write to the same key. There's no possibility. So we even don't need to use a transaction. But of course, now let's suppose if this optional URL count uh, param like column is not optional and we would like to also update the URL count for the users. This is actually the number of URLs, short URLs that the user has created. And if you want to increment that, then of course now, since we are updating two tables, we have to open a transaction. And within that transaction, we will actually write here and we will write or update this table as well uh, by incrementing the URL count. The reason we are doing that is because we would like to either update both these table or fail the updation of both these tables. We don't want data to be in an inconsistent state where we are able to uh, create the short URL and write it here, but we are unable to increment the count uh, here for, the, uh, for, for, the, for that user. That's why 
if we have to update both these tables then what we will do that we will actually use a transaction object we will open a transaction on the data store and then we will uh, using that transaction we will update both these tables and then we will commit the transaction now there's one more thing that i like to discuss which is about uh, uh, removing or deleting expired link so there are two ways we can achieve that first is that since uh, the data store is cheap we could actually we don't need to run continuously some job which try to go through this data store and try to remove all the expired link what we could do whenever a read request come for a link we will check first whether the link or the short url is expired or not and if it is expired at that time we can remove it from the data store and we can actually return not found other would be that we can actually run some job some background job that could run maybe once maybe in every three months or six months that will be running in a background in a low priority uh, and it will actually scan the data store for the expired link and if it found some expired link it will remove them since we have since we are using a uh, base 64 uh, encoding so there's a possibility of um, almost 68.5 billion short urls that we can create once we have exhausted that limit then we have two approaches that we can do first either we can increase the length of the short url from six to seven which will then give us a way larger uh, number of short urls that we can generate the other would be that we can always go to scan the data store and when we find some expired uh, short urls we can actually uh, put them in some bucket or some table uh, from where we can actually retrieve them in these application servers and those application servers then can use those free or available uh, short urls uh, for generating uh, a, a newer mapping between a big url and the short url so today we discuss uh, the design of uh, URL shortening service like tiny URL. Uh, we didn't go in detail about the design of data store or the global in-memory cache. Uh, this may be uh, I will discuss in my some future video. Uh, so today I showed you how uh, different uh, requirements like functional and non-functional requirements dictate our design and if we change the requirements how it changed the design of the service that we create. Uh, we actually have a requirement that we would like a user to have an account to create short URLs. Let me know in the comment below how the design will change if we allow anonymous users to also uh, create short URL. There's also one more thing that I did not discuss here right today, uh, which is that the load balancer, it is not only used for distributing the read and write request to these application server, but another purpose of load balancer is to also rate limit the read and write request from certain user in order to avoid denial of service attacks from malicious users. Uh, maybe in some future video I will discuss this when I will discuss the design of load balancer. Also let me know in the comment below if you would like me to discuss the design of certain uh, distributed systems. And I hope uh, you find this uh, video very useful and if you like it please like it on the YouTube website and also please subscribe to this channel and click the bell icon if you like to get notified about my future video. Thank you and take care.